Thank you um, very much for inviting me. Um, this is going to be kind of a rant, I guess. Um, I uh, I apologize about that in advance. Um, I hope that you find it interesting. I think there's I I, I think what's going on here in this uh, program here at Chapman is is amazing and very uh, and a really good thing. Uh, I just want to make a suggestion that philosophers of science ought to pay a little more attention to what the scientists are doing than they sometimes do. So that's what my rant is about. Okay, so for a long time, philosophers of science have thought about the so-called logic of science. So logical positivists, logical empiricists were engaged in a kind of rational reconstruction of what it is that scientists are actually up to when they explain aspects of the world when they relate different theories to one another, when they determine whether a theory should be replaced in the face of recalcitrant evidence, et cetera. Philosophers of physics, by and large, have also focused on foundational problems in so-called fundamental theories. Examples of these include the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, problem of irreversibility in statistical mechanics, reconciling quantum field theory with the general theory of relativity, and a bunch of other foundational problems uh, that appear in so-called fundamental theory. And I think at least some of the attempts to address foundational problems have involved trying to uh, fix up the logical foundations of the theories, right? The issue is that the problems in, with the theories are that the logical foundations were kind of messed up. And if we only find the proper axiomization, uh, we're going to solve all of, the, all of these sort of logical foundational problems. So that's what I just said. And I think a, class, a, a really fine example of this kind of approach, though not a particularly successful one, in my opinion, is the algebraic approach to the foundations of quantum field theory, where philosophers and uh, mathematical physicists have been looking for found, uh, axiomizations that uh, actually have real live <laughs> applications to the world, and they've kind of failed to do so. Um, so there's my rant again. Uh, what's happening here? So another example concerns attempts building on Hilbert's sixth mathematical problem to develop, quote, mathematically the limiting processes which take us from the atomistic view to the laws of motion of the continuum. And if we consider that latter problem, it's a problem that concerns the relations between two theories at different scales, continuum fluid dynamics, for example, and molecular dynamics. And the question is, how can we connect the fundamental theories concerning the microstructures of materials like gases and fluids and solids with those theories that describe and characterize and predict uh, the behavior of many body systems at everyday scales? These are engineering theories, which are still in use today. They get the nature of the of the materials completely wrong as they suggest that there's no uh, structure at all, all the way down to the in infinitesimal, and we know that that's false. And philosophers in this sort of logical empiricist tradition and their descendants take this question to be answered by showing that the laws that govern the materials at the continuum scales can be reduced to the laws governing the behavior of their fundamental components. And often, whoops, I'm sorry. Oftentimes, philosophers focus on the fundamental theory and try to construct logical derivations of the reduced theory's laws from those of the reducing theory. That involves finding bridge laws or principles that connect terms that appear in the different theories. I think that this particular approach to inter-theory relations has also not been particularly successful. And even more mathematical, more sophisticated mathematical attempts to derive upper scales behaviors from equations governing the motions of the constituents fail in all but exceptional cases. So a recent review entitled From Newton to Navier-Stokes or How to Connect Fluid Mechanics Equations from Microscopic to Macroscopic Scales by Isabella Gallagher shows some progress, but only it seems to me for extremely dilute systems like ideal gases, where the 
where standardly there's no interactions among the components. And we know that real fluids and real gases are interacting uh, at, the, at the microscopic level uh, all the time. So I think this philosophical focus on foundational problems has instilled a sort of metaphysical bias towards fundamental theories. It's led to attempts to make direct connections, whether logical or mathematical, between theories at different scales. And what I want like to suggest is that if we pay attention to methods employed by condensed matter physicists and condensed matter theorists in studying many body systems, that's going to lead us in a different direction, one where various applied mathematical techniques and not logical techniques take center stage. And so that's the focus of my talk today. I want to try to highlight places of synergy where I think between philosophers and physicists and scientists. So let's consider the Navier-Stokes equations. So these are the equations that describe how fluid, fluids flow in pipes and how they flow past obstacles, et cetera. They're of particular concern here are these two parameters, eta, which is the viscosity of the fluid, and rho, which is the density of the fluid. Um, those are called material parameters. Let's see here. And typically, one determines values for those material parameters through measurements and experiments, through tabletop experiments. But neither viscosity nor density appear in the fundamental theory of molecular dynamics. And so that's going to suggest that we need to find these connections between features of the molecular dynamics and the material parameters that appear in the continuum theories. And before I get to these connections, I'd like to ask how we should properly think about such parameters. What's the proper way to think about material parameters? So let's consider the theoretical nature of these parameters. And in order to do that, I'll briefly talk about a different kind of parameter, the so-called order parameter, that plays an important role in understanding phase transitions. I'm going to say ultimately that material parameters and order parameters are essentially theoretically the same. Uh, but I'm jumping around between uh, examples in continuum mechanics to examples in condensed matter to examples in material science, primarily to show how ubiquitous this method that I'm trying that I'm trying to describe actually is in science, and that we as philosophers of science ought to pay more attention to it. So let's consider an example. So suppose we have suppose we have a magnet and a, a lump of magnetite and a compass. If we came upon that lump of ferromagnetic material while we were hiking in the woods uh, with the compass, and hopefully people still remember what those are, um, we could determine the direction of magnetization in the lump of the ferromagnetic material. And if we heated it up over our campfire, suppose, then at least theoretically, we could notice that above a certain temperature, the lump of ferromagnetic material is no longer magnetic. Uh, at that level or scale, we might believe that we've discovered a new quantity, the net magnetization M of this material. And we can consider that to be a function. We we'll treat it as a continuum parameter along the lines of the viscosity and the density in the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, and we might consider it to be a function of temperature. We get a picture that looks something like this. So here we have a magnetic order parameter. If we're, if we're way up here above one, then it's really hot. All the spins have been thermalized, so there's complete rotational invariance. And as we cool it down, then all of a sudden at this, at this critical temperature, that rotational symmetry gets broken and there's a preferred direction in space, in space right? So it either, either go the North Pole or the South Pole. And at that level of observation, as I said, this parameter is going to be treated as a continuum parameter, just like the parameters that appear in the ideal gas law. But we know, of course, that the ferromagnetic is at atomic scales composed of many atoms with little spin magnetic moments attached to them. But from the point of view of the atomic scales, from the perspective of so-called fundamental theory, we don't see that order parameter at all, right? All we see are the interactions between the individual spins and their nearest neighbors. And theoretically, though, the net magnetization is defined as the difference between the densities 
of upspins and downspins at space-time points, as in this equation here, number three. Um, that's a quantity that is defined at scales that are considerably below that of the continuum, but also considerably above that of atomic scales. It's a mesoscopic parameter, right? It also allows us to say an awful lot about the macroscopic behavior of our system uh, without having to know much detail at all about the nature of the system at its most fundamental scales, right? We can make predictions about symmetry breaking, phase transitions, et cetera. And as such, that ability to make the, to say stuff about the macroscopic nature of the materials reflects a kind of relative autonomy of continuum scale behavior from those lower scale fundamental details of the material. And that might suggest that the fundamental details really don't have a whole heck of a lot to do with the continuum scale behaviors. Michael Fisher, one of the pioneers of condensed matter theory, in particular pioneers of the renormalization group, believe that understanding the order parameters in that way yields a profound conclusion about the structure of the world. And he said, significantly in my view, Landau's introduction of the order parameter exposed a novel and unexpected foliation or level in our understanding of the physical world. Traditionally, one characterizes statistical mechanics as directly linking the microscopic world of nuclei and atoms to the macroscopic world characterized at lengths of millimeters and meters. But the order parameter, he says, as a dynamic fluctuating object, in many cases intervenes on an intermediate or mesoscopic level char characterized by scales of tens or hundreds of angstroms. Okay, so he's saying that the traditional way of thinking is, to, is sort of this same way that philosophers typically try to think about the relations between theories at fundamental and less fundamental scales by finding direct connections. But if we notice that these material parameters and this uh, order parameter plays an uh, in-between role, maybe that's a better way to think about the relations between theories at different scales. So the definition of the order parameter demonstrates that that parameter is actually coding for correlations between spin components. These are fluctuations in aggregates of the atomic components, the spins, fluctuations in those spins lead to correlations. Um, and we get a picture that looks something like this. So you could think of the black regions as uh, regions of up spins. So those regions are all, the spins there are all correlated with one another. So now back to the Navier-Stokes equations and the viscosity and the density. Just like the order parameter, those parameters should be understood as mesoscopic, mesoscale parameters. They code for structures that are present at scales between the continuum and the atomic. And what I want to and I and I suggested earlier that uh, a reductionist or foundationalist direct connection between atomic scales and continuum scales typically won't work to determine the value for those in material parameters that appear in those continuum equations. But a reductionist might push back and say, on the contrary, it's really quite easy to make those direct connections. So consider the parameter rho, the density. There's no density parameter in the theory of molecular dynamics, but a reductionist might argue as follows. Oops. Um, suppose our molecular theory says that there are n molecules per unit volume, then we can determine the average mass density as a function of the position in the fluid and the side length, a length L of a small volume centered on X. So that's going to give us, we count the number of molecules. We find that there's N molecules inside this little cube. Uh, next, we take limits, and then we can determine a continuum density rho of X. And we've, uh, we've essentially, oh no, what's happening here? Ah, God, I'm sorry. Okay, so essentially it looks like we've solved our continuum problem, our, our upscaling problem, right? You just simply find your little volume elements, take averages and, uh, and upscale using those averages. I don't understand what's going on. Look for lower scale analogs of the upper scale parameters and take limiting averages. But unfortunately, that really works only very rarely. 
And to see why this kind of simple volume averaging will almost always fail, we're now gonna switch from fluids to materials. And I'll come back to fluids and hydrodynamic descriptions in a little bit. So let's think about materials like steel, railroad tracks, steel girders, et cetera. At everyday scale, steel bars look reasonably homogeneous. If we look at it with our naked eye or with a magnifying glass, we don't see much structure at all. It appears to be pretty uniform. But if we zoom in, we reveal hidden structures that are, we reveal structures that are hidden at everyday scales, and you get a picture that looks something like this. So steel exhibits all sorts of different kinds of structures at different scales. And in order to describe that dominant important features, those dominant important features of steel, there was a way to get rid of this thing. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> um, at these shorter length scales, we employ this sort of really quite important notion of a representative volume element. And the representative volume element, the point P is called a material point in continuum mechanics. It's surrounded by an infinitesimal material element. The structure in the material element, the voids, the cracks, the boundaries, et cetera, those are to be treated as the microstructure of that macro, that macro material element. And so there are three scales really involved here. There's the continuum scale, capital D, by which the neighborhood of the material point is characterized. There's the micro scale, little d, that represents the smallest microstructures whose properties are believed to influence the continuum behaviors, the stresses and strains on the materials. And typically, as we'll see, shapes are the most important features of those structures. And then there's the, of course, there's the atomic or the lattice scale. So let's consider a well-mixed composite, let's say 50% of which is a good thermal conductor and 50% of which is a good insulator. So we have this 50-50 volume mix mixture. And let's say the red phase is the conductor. So if we try to infer the conductivity of the material by simple volume averaging, we were gonna, we're gonna be grossly in error. So if we just simply volume average on this, this left side here, where the red phase is the conductor, we're going to grossly underestimate the conductivity of the material. Right? So, and if the red materials are the inclusions, then the material will be a terrible conductor. Right? So volume averaging, and that's because of the conductivity, because of the topological connections in the, in between those things. Volume averaging of this sort that's typically assumed in reductive programs isn't a very good means to upscale from uh, from fundamental scales to continuum properties of systems. In fact, making direct connections between atomic and molecular level and continuum and continuum scales is not as straightforward as many reductionist programs assume. So how then can one actually determine the theoretical values for these material parameters or the order parameters? Well, if you examine the actual mathematica, mathematical practice that allows for this, um, I hope to show you, to give you an argument that such practice actually has some philosophical consequences for debates about the proper way, for example, to carve nature at its joints. So there are mathematical physical reasons for, for why some parameters or variables are the right ones for describing natural phenomena. Now that previous example showed that simple volume, volume averaging is almost always doomed to fail for connecting fundamental theories to continuum scales. It also showed the importance of these mesoscale structures in the representative volume elements. And in order to upscale, in order to make connections between the lower scale and the continuum scales, we need an awful lot of information about the structure in the relevant representative volume elements. Specifically, we need information about the geometry and the topology, the shapes and connectivity of the structures in those representative volume elements. And we can represent that information using correlation functions. So consider a two phase random medium where we have a red phase and a white phase. Let, the, let this volume be the representative volume element. It's simply the union of the red portion and the white portion. Um, 
for some point in that representative volume element, we can define indicator or characteristic functions with kick back a one if it's in the if it's in the relevant um, if it's in the relevant phase or a zero if it's not. And then we can sort of start throwing darts at the representative volume element. And um, so we imagine that we're pretty bad dart throwers, but we're good enough to get it on to hit the to hit the representative volume element. So if we we can determine then limited relative frequencies of randomly thrown darts in, in, in the various phases. So we can ask a bunch of questions about this representative volume element. We can ask, what's the probability that the dart lands in the red phase? That'll give us the volume fraction of the red phase, right? That we would get with simple volume averaging. We can now throw line segments and ask what's the probability that two points in V separated by a line segment of length R, say, are both in the red, are both in the red material. We can ask what's the probability that an entire line segment of length R lies completely in the red sector, et cetera. We can ask lots and lots of questions. And so you get a picture like this. We can throw darts, we can throw line segments, we can throw triangles of different sizes, and we can gain a lot of information about the structure of that representative volume element. And those are all questions about correlations, and they can tell us about the shapes and connectedness of various structures in the representative volume element. So to determine the structure of a representative volume element, we need one point, two point, three point, end point correlation functions for n going to infinity. In order to determine the continuum scale conductivity of the material, which is a field quantity, we need effectively an infinite amount of information. So exact upscaling is hard, even if we start at mesoscales considerably above the atomic lattice. I haven't said anything about what's going on at the atomic scales here, really, or not very much. Nevertheless, there are homogenization methods that allow us to find a range of values for effective, material, for effective material parameters like the conductivity or like the viscosity. And once we understand that material parameters are, are coding for these correlational structures, we can employ these hom homogenization techniques to determine the ranges of those values. And we can also explain the relative autonomy of the continuum equations from this fundamental scale details. And furthermore, these mesoscale correlations can be probed via scattering experiments. They're the kinds of things we can actually look at via light scattering, or in the case of magnets, via neutron scattering, et cetera. And importantly, the values for those material parameters can't be determined by focusing at the, at the local on the local interactions between the constituents at the molecular scale, right? You really need to move up to these uh, can mesoscale quantities uh, that are defined, as I said. So in philosophy of science and metaphysics, there have long been debates about what are the natural kinds or what are the properties that so-called carve nature at its joints. Sometimes people have said these are the properties that figure in laws that we appeal to when we provide explanations. And it's most often assumed that such joint carving properties are to be found in our fundamental theories, at least in contemporary analytic metaphysics of science. And to the contrary, what I'd like to argue is that mesoscale structures represented by these material parameters and order parameters provide the natural kinds by which to explain the bulk behavior of continuum systems. And that means that for many questions about such behavior, it's essentially futile to start at the fundamental with the fundamental quantities and the parameters that characterize the system at the lowest scale. And this argument really isn't based on philosophical intuitions about laws and their, their relating kinds to kinds, nor is it really based on metaphysical speculation about the fundamental and therefore maybe what's natural. Instead, it appeals to science, right? It appeals to, at least in some cases, to the so-called fluctuation dissipation theorem of statistical mechanics and its consequences. So just briefly, consider a fluid or a gas in a cylinder that's received a really quick push. So the density of the gas, when you do that, then the 
the molecules are going to pile up near the piston. Uh, and so there, there will be, those molecules will be correlated in a way that the ones further away are not, if they started out in equilibrium. And then these correlations will then decay as the system returns to equilibrium. Now consider the fluid in equilibrium. From a statistical mechanical point of view, material parameters like density are constantly fluctuating about their average values. So the fluid could have gotten into a not such a non-equilibrium state by a spontaneous fluctuation away from equilibrium. Kadanoff and Narton put this as follows. They say that the response of a system to an external disturbance can always be expressed in terms of the time-dependent correlation functions of the undisturbed system. More particularly, the linear response of a system disturbed slightly from equilibrium is characterized by the expectation value in the equilibrium ensemble of a product of two space and time dependent operators. When a disturbance leads to a very slow variation in space and time of all physical quantities, the response may alternatively be described by linearized hydrodynamic equations. So there are two important consequences of this. The first is that we can understand the linear response of a non-equilibrium system, a system that's out of equilibrium, in terms of the statistical mechanic or mechanical characterization of that system of the corresponding equilibrium system, right? So equilibrium theory itself has sufficient uh, power to help us understand some, at least some non-equilibrium behavior. The second co consequence is that these responses to either spontaneous fluctuations away from equilibrium or to external pushes away from equilibrium can be characterized using correlation functions. From the first consequence, it follows that, as I said, that equilibrium statistical mechanics itself has a means to describe non-equilibrium behavior of transport properties, at least in the slow linear regime. And so we can characterize and describe some non-equilibrium behavior from a non-reductionist non-Boltzmannian perspective. We don't need to assume that uh, essentially the, car, the, uh, the molecules are uncorrelated with one another. And that's the four core, core philosophical consequence of what's known as the fluctuation dissipation theorem. That theorem affirms a general relationship between the response of a many body system to external disturbance and the internal fluctuation of the system in the absence of that disturbance. The second consequence, from the second consequence, it follows that there have to be structures at mesoscales that the correlation functions are representing, right? Those structures are the gradients of conserved quantities like particle number, density, and other transport properties. And so from the point of view of mesoscale modeling of material parameters, the representative volume elements in fluid, in fluid contexts also represent correlational structures, just as we need to represent correlational structures in those representative volume elements in the context of materials science. These are structures that reflect, for example, the pileup of molecules near the piston or those created by fluctuations and the correlation functions code for natural parameters uh, with which to examine the continuum scale behaviors of many body systems. The fluctuation dissipation theorem guarantees the existence of those structures. Okay, I'm gonna skip this part and just go to conclusion here. So, as a philosopher of science, I hope to engage with science and scientists so as to better understand the nature of scientific methodology. Oops. So I'm interested in particular in the nature of explanation, the proper way to think about inter-theory or inter-scale relations, the relative autonomy, or maybe the emergence of continuum theories from more fundamental theories, and the nature of natural properties and variables. I believe that for philosophers to have useful and fruitful conversations with scientists, philosophers need to pay close attention to actual scientific practice, in particular the mathematics that gets used and not simply look for rational, logical reconstructions of what they're doing. 
They should learn the scientist's way of characterizing their work. We should not insist upon philosophical inter terminology and philosophical characterizations of science that originated largely in primarily failed attempts at rational and logical reconstruction. And in the course of this presentation, I touched upon work in condensed matter physics really quite broadly construed. It include fluid mechanics, material science, the physics of phase transitions, and even really methods in, that are prominent in quantum field theory, where you have endpoint correlation or Green's functions. And all of this, I hope, shows the ubiquity of certain mathematical methods across disciplines that study many body systems that exhibit radically different behaviors at different scales. So there is this, there is this uh, mathematical method that plays a major role in the in in um, in scientific descriptions of uh, many body systems, which if you adopt a sort of reductionist focus only on the fundamental point of view uh, way that many philosophers of science are, if not openly endorsing sort of, you know, it's in the background. So I think that paying attention to these applied mathematical methods is considerably more philosophically fruitful than focusing on the logical and axiomatic reconstructions of physical theories. And I hope to have demonstrated that studying what scientists actually do, and in particular, and in particular the prominent use of correlation functions to characterize bulk material behaviors, that that can lead to some philosophical insight. So if philosophers pro focus primarily on traditional foundational problems and on direct connections, direct reductive relations between theories, then we're gonna miss out, I think, on various important philosophical and conceptual advancements. And so um, those are places where there should be synergy between the philosophers and the scientists. So thanks for that. It sounds like uh, uh, this very rich talk, and uh, I could not follow all of it, I must admit, but I do not recall the point that was really very uh, so powerful for me, but I have not understood your argument. At some point, you have you stated that the mathematical practice to address the problem had theoretical consequences. And I would like to understand better how you made this point, maybe which aspect of the mathematical practice you think uh, had theoretical consequences. Could you return to this statement? Sure. So the idea there was that, um, do you want me to go back in the slides? No. So the idea is typically when philosophers think about natural kinds or what are the right variables with which to describe systems, right? Um, or natural parameters. They appeal to certain intuitions about the nature of laws. So laws relate natural kinds to natural kinds. So for example, you know, I have a law that says, it seems like this is a law that all copper conducts electricity. That seems, that seems like a pretty good law. But if I only have pennies in my pocket, uh, even though I guess they're not made of copper anymore, but suppose I have only copper things in my pocket. Suppose I have pennies in my pocket, uh, and I have a I have a I have a um, a generalization that says all objects in my pocket conduct electricity, right? Then if I were to put a pencil in my pocket, it wouldn't be a conductor, right? So it wouldn't support counterfactuals. Whereas if I if I said if this pencil were made of copper, then it would conduct electricity. So that's the kind of uh, that's a way of thinking about the nature of what the natural or the right properties are that can be related in laws. That's one way that philosophers have thought about what's in, what are the natural kinds, the things that the, the right properties with which to carve nature at its joints, right? And so um, what I was trying to argue is that if you pay attention, at least in, at least in this um, fluid case where, where you have the piston being pushed really hard quickly, um, 
there are there are that 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 introduces correlations among the molecules that are close to the piston, and then those correlations will slowly decay as the system moves back to equilibrium. This scientific theorem from statistical mechanics, the fluctuation dissipation theorem, um, basically tells you that those those correlations have to be there and that they're going to decay in a certain kind of way. So I think those are those are the this telling those that's telling us that these mesoscale correlational structures are the natural structures with which to appeal in order to characterize the bulk behavior of systems that have been pushed out of equilibrium. So that's a scientific mathematical uh, argument for why certain variables or certain parameters are the natural parameters, the right ones to use, and not some others, right? I mean, any function, essentially, of the positions and velocities of all the um, components of that gas, that's a perfectly okay quantity, but most of those quantities are going to decay in 10 to the minus 12 seconds, right? But there are some that are relatively long lived. Those are the ones that are uh, that are that are coding for uh, these kind of correlational structures that um, will decay in the way specified by that 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 theorem. Does that help? Yeah. I respond to that in the way that I respond to my students in seminars who always say, well, but in principle, you can do this. And I'm saying, well, people say that all the time, but I've never, they never give you any idea of exactly how that's supposed to happen. And I mean, that one paper from Isabella Gallagher that I cited is an attempt to talk about the kinds of successes that one can get. And uh, from a sort of starting from the, even from the Newtonian dynamics to get all the way up to the uh, Navier-Stokes equation. Um, the only kinds of results that you can get are, are um, incredibly weak in the sense that mostly they only apply to systems which exhibit very little interaction. Um, and they make assumptions like the Stossalansatz about how you know, at each instant in time, none of these, none of the molecules are correlated with one another. That's what enables us to get a kind of bulk mania and irreversible approach. Um, but, you know, the very, the very fact that these molecules are colliding with one another tells you that they're correlated quite, quite severely. So I, I mean, if somebody would tell me other, would, would at least suggest what the arg what this in principle argument would look like, then I would be more satisfied. I don't have an argument that says, you know, if there is a fundamental theory of everything that we can't explain, that we can't derive everything. But I think that the the way our world is set up, uh, the fact that you know systems exhibit different behaviors at different scales, and that we can sort of asymptotically efface behaviors saying we don't need to pay any attention to the lower scale behavior in order to understand the upper scale behavior and vice versa. Those are those are um, reasons to think that this kind of uh, in principle connections are just not going to be very helpful. That's I guess that's what I have to say. Do you think that you can kind of break things down into a hierarchy of processes like you're talking about? Like, rather than trying to go directly from fundamental to macroscopic, go from fundamental to some small scale, go from there to the next scale, and try to make sense of the intermediate steps to build up something that goes all the way from the fundamental to the macroscopic? So, yeah, so you're going to, you want to say, well, then we can just like put these all together and we'll get the, we'll get the derivation that we're after. Um, I think the problem with that is that, um, 
really, if you just start with the fundamental interactions, uh, like in a in a lattice or even you know in a in a gas or a fluid, you're just never going to be able to uh, determine what those mesoscale structures are like, what those what those um, correlational structures in the representative volume element are. You just can't see them from those scales, right? So I think it's essential that one uh, start at the middle, basically. And this is not just in the physics. This is, uh, there's a lot of work in, in systems biology and um, even in the Dennis Noble's cardiac physiome project where the idea is one starts with, um, with the mesoscale of cells if you want to try to understand how heart attack, why somebody has a heart attack, you need to start with the cells and you need to make connections with molecular uh, genetic stuff that's going on, but also you need continuum things like blood pressure and things like that. So, so it's often that kind of, there's often, there's a kind of methodology that's getting more and more uh, is being talked about more and more for large systems. And that is this kind of middle outer, um, mesoscale first approach. And I just don't see uh, I don't see how you make those connections, right the 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 mesoscale uh, structures in those representative volume elements um, to try to derive them from the the interactions of the individual molecules or whatever, I think are um, I mean well anyway, the Nobody's succeeded in coming even close to it. So you need to go to the middle, somewhere between the fundamental and what you're calling the mesoscale, and look for that to be the middle that you can try to build from both directions. Right. That's sort of the idea. Yeah. And I think that's a a kind of a radically different sort of view of scientific method, methodology, uh, at least from the point of view of a bunch of you know, the empiricist logical positivist tradition that still holds sway, in my opinion to this day. Oh, yeah. Mostly just a question of clarification, but at one point in the, the toward the end of the talk, you asked us um, in terms of drawing a kind of some philosophical lessons from applied science, um, and just wondering if you could flesh that out a little bit more because it wasn't clear to me how much this lesson was really a matter of you know, applied physics and applied science. So much as just it's, it's a question about meso scale level level physics and this which which you could interpret just as a theoretical right, yeah. science. And so it just wasn't clear to me what the commitment was. I mean, the um, I think mostly what I was trying to get out there was just the idea that in trying to make connections across scales and uh, different behaviors, there are um, a lot of techniques that have been developed by material scientists, for example, by condensed matter theorists. Um, those techniques are not really derivational in a way that you know philosophers would think about making direct connections so that's that's all i mean it's like getting away from the main the logic driven axiomatic forward approach that seemed to be uh, being put forward um. yeah, it occurs to me this is just a general remark uh, the connection is what Thomas has talked in words if you start with Steven Weinberg he managed to believe that there's no influence in significant influence of the of the sciences. Well, he was a notorious reductionist. And if he's looking at what's going on in philosophy of science, he's seeing the logical positivist method, these kind of reductionist methods, but the business sort of what Marx calls theory free thinking yeah. going on in the sciences. And he said, Well, of course, that's ridiculous. That's totally ridiculous. So there is no such thing. So now he had his other reasons for saying what he said, he completely ignores all the bell results and, and just that's not important philosophy. He also wanted to superconducting super, super But it seems that reductionism here is, is sort of the evil 
uh, demon, right, that has polluted so much of how we view the real world of philosophy and so on. Yeah, that's, that's essentially, I mean, I completely agree with that. And I think, uh, and I think even though people say logical empiricism, logical positivism are failed programs, uh, you still see that reductionist bent among scientists and among philosophers, but particularly among philosophers. And I just think it's it, because of because of the way the world is put together, right? With these, with the with different behaviors at different scales. I mean, look, if I want to understand why a, if I want to understand what the um, I'm interested in understanding the behavior of a violin, violin string, right? And I want to know what the harmonic structure is. Well, then I need to idealize and think that the the string is fixed at the bridge and fixed at the nut and impose mathematical boundary conditions on those. And then I can solve the partial differential equation and solve for the, the harmonic modes. If I want to explain how it is that uh, the violin makes a sound that I can hear, then I need to shift scales completely and tell a kind of molecular dynamical story about how energy is get transferred from the bridge, from the string to the bridge to the sound box. And that's a completely different mathematical problem. It's a different kind of equation. They're ordinary differential equations, not partial differential equations. Uh, the idea that one can tell a reductive story starting with those ODEs, that's exactly the problem that Gallagher was trying to solve. And it, I just think it's, um, you know, basically. Hopefully that helps a little. There's one question on Zoom. I don't know if you can take it or what is it? Yeah. Can you can you see me here? Can you hear me? That's the question. Okay. Let me I don't oh I need to look at the participants here. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, is this it's, it's, Damien? Yeah, it's Damien. Yes. Can okay. You... Hang on a second. I know somehow need to make you very loud, but <laughs> yeah. Okay, try try to ask now. Oh yes. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Well, I can. I don't know about the rest of the audience. Go ahead. Oh shit. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, my 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 question is uh, is as follows. So, I mean, from what I understand, so you what you suggest is that, for instance, this difficulty of handling the mesoscale problem mathematically is something that is uh, that the physicists deal with using indeed. I mean, without making direct mathematical uh, deductions from, say, the microscopic or the macroscopic theory. But but on the other hand, uh, I mean, what, what one could see, see this maybe differently and say that basically there's there's a mathematical problem here waiting to be solved and that physicists are trying to solve in their own way. You know, I mean, this kind of thing, for instance, also happens in, you know, mirror symmetry, for instance, you know, where you have mirror symmetry comes from a kind of strange physical intuition and physicists have, have physicists have come up with some formulae for instance for certain quantities without really providing any any very good proof and then it's only much later that ma ma mathematicians actually found ways to prove these things using using very involved uh, methods but the thing is i mean in in this case well the physicists might do this but on the other hand this is just a mathematical problem waiting to be solved I mean, it's, isn't it? I mean, it's not something that is basically will be uh, is doomed to be inaccessible. It's just very hard. I mean, if <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. if if there is a in principle way of doing that, then I I guess yeah. But I mean, uh, you know, the the main problem is that we actually don't have any theories that aren't effective theories. Even our best theory of quantum field theory is is an effective theory. We have no idea uh, 
what a what a what a non-effective fundamental theory would be. And so that's why the quantum field theorists resort to, you know, calculating all these endpoint green functions in order to sort of say what's going on with their fields. And I'm trying to say the same thing is really happening uh, uh, across the board here. So, so are you saying that so there's a kind of conceptual obstruction, for instance, for this mes so for the understanding of mesoscale parameters for, for really understanding it in terms of, of microscopic parameters? I mean, there's... I'm saying that if I want to, if I'm interested in, in explaining how it is that, um, among other things, how it is that uh, theories like Continuum theories like those of Navier Cauchy for solids and, and Navier Stokes for fluids, how it is that they are so successful, so um, safe to use. We use them in engineering contexts all the time, but they um, completely get the ontology wrong, right? And um, so the question is, can we explain can we explain that stability? essentially under perturbation of all the potential lower scale details. And um, the answer is yes, if we start with the mesoscale, but if we start at the fundamental scale, we're never gonna be able to do it, right? There's a kind of universality that is, is displayed by these continuum theories. Um, that is, uh, if you go down and look at the particular interactions among the atoms, you're only going to be talking about one particular system, and you're not going to be able to characterize that kind of universal behavior that the uh, that the continuum equations are characterizing. Maybe yeah, but then, so so you're making an a priori statement about the possibility to do this. Then, well, somebody who <laughs> says in principle that it's in principle possible to do that is also <laughs> making an a priori statement in the same way. Yeah. So okay. we're at loggerheads, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I'm just, uh, yeah, anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Thanks. I think it's time to thank Bob anyway. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Thanks. 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 Thanks for listening. <laughs> I'm sorry it was such now a rant. We have a coffee break, I think. <laughs>